Justin Miller, Rockstar College Physics here. We are moving forward. So what do we want to move forward into? Move forward into the realms of continuous charge distributions. So what do you mean continuous? Well, I mean that we have so many electrons or protons that are exposed, packed together in some sort of distribution that we can consider it to be continuous even though there is really fundamentally no such thing as a continuous charge distribution because everything comes in little packets of electrons and protons, little discrete entities. If there's enough of them, well, if we can start treating a charged object as having a continuous charge distribution, and then well, we're kind of from there. So this is what we've got. Continuous, continuous charge distributions. Continuous. All right. So consider this. Consider a collection. Point charges. So we can take, say, one, two, three point charges. Say we've got a Q1, Q2, Q3. I'm not going to write it out. We've got three point charges. We say, what's the electric field at some region in space? What region? We can really pick anywhere. We can say, what's the electric field here, or here, or here, anywhere we want, right? And what would you say the electric field is? What's well, the vector sum of the individual fields due to these individual charges at that particular location? I say, yeah, that's easy to do. There's only three charges. I say, okay, well, what if there's not three, there's five? I say, well, you do the same thing. There's five charges. So what? You add up all the individual fields due to the individual charges at that location that you want to know the electric field, and voila, you've got the electric field. I say, well, okay, what if there's... 10 or 20 or 20. a whole bunch. Say, well, <laughs> in principle, you just keep doing the same thing, right? As long as you know where every charge is, you just determine what its electric field is at the location in question and add it together with all the other electric fields. I say, yeah, that seems easy, right? Well, it is in principle, but in practice, that sort of gets out of hand really quick. Think about a billion charges or Avogadro's number of electrons. Oh my gosh, do you want to do that? times 10 to the 23rd times? I don't. I don't. That would take forever. And I don't have forever to solve one physics problem, so I had to come up with some way of getting a good idea of how things would work when things are so tightly packed together. So what if I just use a little approximation here and I said that the charges are so close together that I can consider them to be continuous. There's so many of them that occupy a relatively small space that I'm just gonna say they're spread out evenly and it's, con it's continuous. It's like I've spread butter on toast. But instead it's electrons on, I don't know, a stick. Anyways, if we just go ahead and say, well, continuous, you can say there's some charge right there, some charge distribution. You can call this a line charge. And we can say that this line charge has some line charge density. Line charge density. Lambda. Lambda. This is a little lambda there. So we got a continuous line charge, and then we say it has a line charge density. What is the line charge density? Well, it tells us how much charge there is per unit length. Coulombs per meter is charge per unit length. So if it's a uniform line charge density, 
then the actual line charge density itself is just the <coughs> amount of charge per unit length. It doesn't matter what chunk you take, it's the same amount because it's uniform. But the charge density could vary. It could be really packed together here and then get um, lesser and lesser and lesser towards this end where you've got a variation of the density. Or it just could be constant. Either way, it doesn't really matter. But if it's constant, if lambda is constant, the charge is evenly distributed across the line. And if that is the case, then we have that lambda is equal to the total charge divided by the length of well, the line in, under consideration. Q divided by L, which is total charge divided by length. So I would say that this has some length L and houses within that length L some total charge. So uniform line charge density, lambda is just that total charge divided by the length. You cut it in half, whoop, it has half the charge. You cut it in a quarter, it has a quarter of the charge. But the density is the same everywhere. So that's great. What if the line charge density is not uniform? We can still write that within some infinitesimal line segment, there's some infinitesimal amount of charge. And that defines the line charge density. So we could go something like this. If there's some little DL right there. And within this DL, there is some DQ. So I'm talking about it in terms of infinitesimals here. So what do we have? Well, lambda would be equal then to DQ divided by DL. Or we could write infinitesimal amount of charge is equal to the line charge density divided by DL. This is what we really wanted to get out of this. Is that this here can now either be a constant or it can be a function that describes the variance spatially of the charge density. So this is nice. This is what we want. It gives us a way to correlate the infinitesimal charge to the infinitesimal length and the line charge density itself. And again, this works whether lambda is constant or lambda is varying or has some function that describes it. For us, we're going to keep lambdas constant in this course, but it is possible later on at some point you see, yeah, varying line charge densities um, spatially. But this is a good representation. Why is that good? Well, because now we think about determining what the electric field is due to a line charge. So say electric field due to a continuous distribution. What do we need to do? This is just considering a line charge now, but it correlates with other things. We've got this line charge, and say that we want to know what the electric field is like right here. You say, what's E hat equal to at this point right there? Well, what do we have to do? We have to add up all the contributions to all the infinitesimal elements along this line relative to that location here. So we've got this little element here, this little DL that really has some DQ inside it. And DQ and DL 
are connected by land and the line charge density. But we need to figure out what its contribution is. Well, this can kind of be treated like a point charge in a sense. And what do we do? We find out its contribution here. It is some distance away and has some direction associated with that infinitesimal charge relative to this point. If it's a positive line charge density, it'd be radially outward. If it's a negative line charge density, it'd be radially inward, relative to that point right there. Well, really, this is just filled up with a bunch of DLs or DQs that we would continue to go through, right? You could say, oh, there's another there, and there's another there, there's another there, there's another there, there's another there. A really, I don't want to say it's infinite, but they're the infinitesimals. We have to add up all the contributions across the whole line from this end to that end. How do we do that? Well, we're not treating it as discrete anymore, so it's not a just pick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's all of the space in between the ends of that line density. So hopefully by now, looking at this DQ and going, oh, that reminds me of like doing some sort of integration. What if we integrate over all the charges or the infinitesimal charges relative to that point. That's exactly what we need to do. How do we get what the electric field is at some point? Well, we get that the magnitude of the electric field at some position in space is going to be gotten by the integral of k sub e dq over r squared. Let me just take that away. Oops, I don't want that. R hat. There we go. Look at that. K sub E dq over R squared. This is the same thing that we'd have for a singular point charge if we just took away this, right? This D here. K sub E q and took away the integral too, right? One charge, K sub E q over R squared is the electric field due to the singular point charge. Now we've got infinitesimal point charges that we integrate over. So we integrate over the distribution. From, if it's a line from zero to L. And the tricky thing with this is they're vectors. What do we have? This is relative to a spot. It's not just integrate over this line, it's integrate over the line relative to the point in which you're trying to define what the electric field is. Notice that how I've drawn things out here, each of these spots along this line have different radial distances away from the point in question. That means that this R likely varies as you integrate across the line relative to the point. What else varies? The direction of the electric field varies too. Look at this point here, again, considering this to be a positive line charge density, has an electric field correlated with it in that direction. This point here, it's a little steeper. This point here, a little steeper. This point here, a little steeper. A little steeper, straight up. How do you add vectors together? Oh, they're not scalars, you don't just add numbers, you have to take into account the directionalities, right? So not only do we have variance in the distance that we are away from the infinitesimals as we integrate over it, we have variance in the actual direction of the electric field associated with that particular infinitesimal as we integrate over it. Potentially, depends on exactly where we're doing this, but those are some things that could vary. So how are we going to treat this? Very carefully, that's right, very carefully. So this is just how we start doing things, how we start thinking about continuous charge distributions. We start out with something simple, yeah, line charge distributions, keeping things continuous, but we can also do area charge and volume charge distributions, and just to write down some corresponding densities for those, let's just do that, and then, we can look at a nice, nice system that involves figuring out the electric field due to the line charge. So we can have area charge densities or surface charge densities, generally called surface charge densities, density. We've got a continuous charge across an area.
for the surface charge density. We use this. This is my sigma. I draw it like this. I know some people just do this little rounded thing. I don't know. I'm fancy, or maybe I'm not fancy. It doesn't matter. That's my sigma right there. Sigma. And what do we have? Oops, sigma is, in terms of units, it is the charge per unit area. So we've got coulombs per meter squared in SI units. If sigma is constant. Charge per area, and if there is variance, or if we just want to treat things with infinitesimals, and we can always write that sigma is equal to dq over dA, which gives us that dq is equal to sigma dA. So again, we've got a correlation with the charge, infinitesimal charge, and the infinitesimal areas over which we end up integrating relative to this. Now, this can either be constant, or it can be something that varies spatially, position-wise. We've got volume charge density. And, well, a continuous distribution throughout some volume. Volume charge density, and we use rho. That's my rho. 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 Anyways, there's some rho, and what do we have? We have the same sort of correlations here. We have that the units of rho, SI units, would be charge per unit volume, and rho is a constant. Right, that rho is equal to the total charge divided by the volume. It's charge divided by volume. Oh, I'm looking at the units there. What did I do there? The units for this would be coulombs per cubic meter. This is charge per volume. Total charge divided by the total volume would give us the constant rho or the average rho volume charge density, and we can always write that rho is equal to dq over dv, which gives us the ability to say that dq is equal to rho dv. Fantastic. So we've got a way to associate infinitesimal charges to areas to volumes, and to lines. Now you may say, why do you want to do that? Because we need to know some spatial um, distribution over which that dq exists. And if it's a line, well, there's some dl associated with it. It's an area, there's some dA. If it's a volume, there's some dV. So just having dq here isn't really that helpful unless we know what that dq is contained within. And that really gives us what we're going to be integrating over. Integrate over the line elements, the line segments. Instead of dq here for the line, we would write lambda dl. If it was an area, we'd write dq is sigma dA. If it was a volume, we'd write rho dv. Now, if we're looking at this or this, that would require double and triple integrals. For lines, we can use single integrals, and that's a grand.
But in any of those cases, again, we have to look at the spatial variances, how it's distributed itself in space, and again, relative to some point, and then always be careful of the vector aspect of it. Integrating over vectors can be tricky, so have to be careful. It's not just, let's just integrate, do, 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 do. it's done. No, vector is a lot different. So we'll come back and do a nice little example, or not an example, we'll derive something for a particular, a couple particular cases, and go from there. All right, great.